Father, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for your week, O oh Lord God. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity, O oh Lord God, to study your Torah together and to get into your word. I ask you, Holy Spirit, that as I speak tonight, O oh Lord God, may your words, O oh Lord God, come through me, O oh Father God, that our hearts and, and our lives will be touched and transformed and changed for your glory. Help us to see, O oh Lord God, our life on the pages of your Torah. In Yeshua's name I pray. Amen. All right, so tonight we are in Torah portion Noah, which means rest, and I am going to share my screen with you guys so that you can see my notes. All right, so as I mentioned, we're in Torah portion Noah, which means rest, and it's Genesis chapter 6, verse 9 to 11, verse 32. Now, prophet portion is Isaiah chapter 54, verse 1 to 55, verse 5. And we have quite a few uh, New Testament reading, New Covenant reading. Um, Luke, 4, Luke 17, 20 to 37, Matthew 24, 36 to 44, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 16, 1 Peter 3, 18 to 22, 2 Peter 2, 25. And the psalm for this week is Psalm 29. So before we get into this week's Torah portion, though, I want to share with you guys something that happened um, before this Torah portion began. And it's from Torah portion bear sheet. And I just entitled this uh, the pre-flood era. Pardon my typo there. And this is from Genesis 528. And I think it's important for us to know, you know, get some context of the whole story of Noah and his life before we jump into why God wants to wipe out, you know, all living creature from the face of the earth. So Genesis chapter 5, 28 tells us, Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And this son was Noah. And Noah, as I mentioned, mean rest. And we can see where he told he made a declaration about Noah when Noah was born. Verse 29 says, And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord had cursed. Now, when I read that, I thought that was very interesting because I never realized that what he said before, even, you know, after studying the scripture for so many years, usually when we read about, you know, Noah and the flood or we read through the genealogies, we just focus on, you know, getting through it because we have heard this story so many times. But when we are studying the Torah, it is so much, it is so different from just reading, just to read. And, and I am really always thankful for the opportunity to be able to share with you guys what, you know, I believe that the Lord has given me to share. So it says, he said comfort. And when I looked at this word, it says, and I want you guys to pay really close attention to this word comfort and the meaning of it. It's a Primitive root, and it probably means to sigh, which is to breathe strongly by implication, to be sorry, in a favorable sense, to pity, console, or reflexively to rule, or and unfavorably to avenge oneself, comfort self, ease oneself, or repent, or repenting, or repent of oneself. And that word is very interesting because we see this show up even in our Torah portion this week. So just to give us a little context about, you know, why God wants to wipe out everyone on the face of the earth. This is the end of Torah portion, Beersheet, and this is from Genesis 6, verse 1 to 8. It says, now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose and the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with men forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be 120 years. There were giants. In some translation, it says Nephilim, and I give the references um, where it talks about Nephilim, Numbers 13 and Ezekiel 32, on the earth. In those days and also afterward, when the sons of God and just to be um, give us context of the sons of God, 
Eve, it talks about in Job where it says, when the sons of God presented themselves to the Lord, that Satan himself also presented himself. So the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they were, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent on thoughts of his heart was only evil continued and the Lord was sorry. Some translation said, and the Lord repented. And that is the same word that is used when Lamech says that Noah will comfort us. It's the same word that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them, but Noah found grace in the eyes of God. So as we see here, we see where God see the evil that man has corrupted, you know, the, the earth, their heart is evil and their way is just continuously to do evil. But one thing I, I noticed like in this passage here, it used two separate Hebrew words for the for earth and land. And the first one is Adama, and it's the Strong's H127. And this word, and also H776, Eretz, and Adama is talking about, you know, the dust of the earth or the soil. This is the word that is used when it says that God created man from the dust of the earth. So when it talks about the earth, the Adama, and when it talks about the Eretz, the Eretz is talking about the created earth as a whole. But when it says, when it's talking about the Adama, it's talking about the dust of the earth or the ground that was cursed, the ground that was cursed that cannot produce um, fruitfully for man without him toiling for it. So just so you guys have context of why those two different words are used. So, and we see throughout the scripture, it talks about, in this Torah portion, it talks about the earth and the land or earth and land. And it, they use the word interchangeably in the scripture but as you look, if you look carefully at the words, you will see that there's times when God is talking about the ground itself. And then there's times when he's talking about the, the created earth as a whole. And also here, the word repented or sorry is naham. And it's the same word, as I mentioned, used in chapter five for the comfort where Lamech talks, talks of Noah, this one will comfort us I give you guys an outline of how it's used in scripture it's to be sorry to console oneself to repent regret comfort be comforted be moved to pity have compassion rule suffer grief and repent so the question i ask you know and i i want to say was god sorry that he you know cr created man was he really repenting or was he trying to comfort himself or was he trying to comfort man? Because of that declaration with that first, that first mention of that word comfort, where it says this one will comfort us. And I believe that God truly repented, but also because of his nature that he's a merciful God, even in his plan to destroy all flesh from the earth, he sought a way to bring comfort for man. And that's why he had told Noah to build an ark. So at the end of the Torah portion, we see where it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And now begins our Torah portion, uh, Noah, from verse 9 and 10, it says, chapter six, these are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation, and Noah walked with God, and Noah fathered three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So right away, we see where we learn two things about Noah. He was righteous, 
and he was blameless. And number three, he walked with God. Genesis 7 verse 1 says, And Adonai said to Noah, Come you and all your household into the ark, for you only do I perceive as righteous before me in this generation. See, Noah was righteous, blameless, and he walked before God in his generation. And the first person we saw where the Bible talks about that walked with God was Enoch. And Genesis 5, 21, 24 says, Enoch lived 65 years, then fathered Methuselah. Now Enoch walked with God continually for 300 years. And after he fathered Methuselah, he fathered sons and daughters. So all of Enoch's days were 365 years. And Enoch continually walked with God. Then he was not there because God took him. See, Enoch was so close to God in his relationship that God just took him off the face of the earth. And I remember when I was a young girl and I used to read the scripture, I used to always say, this is how I want to be close to God. I would just want to be so close to God that if he desires to take me, then he will just be able to take me. And, you know, I, I still, you know, think about, you know, being with God in, in such an intimate relationship that, you know, when we walk with God, that our ways please into that my ways please into God and that, you know, God can look at me and say, you know, she is, you know, righteous in my sight. And I think we should all aspire to, to be that righteous person in our generation. So the question I ask is, if Noah was righteous and he walked with God, even the way um, Enoch walked, why didn't God take Noah the same way he took Enoch instead of having him stayed in that wicked and perverse generation and then have him build an ark? And what I believe is that God is merciful. And we know that the scripture tells us that it is not his desire for anyone to perish. And he wanted all his creation to return to him and his ways. He used Noah to warn the people to allow them to repent of their evil and their wickedness. God also wanted to use Noah to teach us and, you know, the generations that followed that even if everyone around you is evil and doing wickedness, you can still walk with God and be righteous and blameless in the eyes of God. And we know that 2 Peter 2, 5 tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. When God told him to build the ark, Noah, Noah preached to his generation but they did not repent. He was a preacher of righteousness. And we see, you know, question we, I ask, you know, how can we be righteous in our generation? And these things that um, the Lord showed me is that 2 Samuel 22, 21 talks about, you know, God's way makes us perfect or blameless. So, when we walk God's ways, then we are perfect or blameless before God. It says, as for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He's a buckler to all of that, all of them that trust in him. Psalm 119 verse 72 says, let my tongue sing about your word for all your commandments are righteous. So we see the word of God makes us righteous. Number two, our righteousness is in God through Yeshua. 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us, therefore, if anyone is in Messiah, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Messiah and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Messiah, God was reconciling the world to himself. See, that was what God desired to do when he told Noah to build the ark and to tell the people to come in. He was trying to reconcile the world to himself, but they refused. And verse 21 says, he made the one who knew no sin, speaking of Yeshua, a sin offering on our behalf so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Number three, 
We are to pray for the peace of the city that we live in, the city, the country, the state. Jeremiah 29, 7, in the midst of uh, captivity, the Lord told them to seek shalom of the city where I took you as captives in exile and pray to Adonai for it. For in its shalom, you have shalom. So it doesn't matter where we live, what's happening in where in in, in our city, in our towns, in our country, in in, in our homes, if we pray for peace, if we, of our environment, then we will be able to live in shalom because the Lord will bring shalom to that area and we will be able to live in peace. Number four, pray for those in authority that it might go well with us. First Timothy 2, 1 and 2 say, pray for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. Psalm 22 28, for dominion belongs to the Lord and he rules over the nations. Colossians 1, 16 to 17, the king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. See, it doesn't matter what the king desire. If God has a plan for that king and we pray for God's will to be done, God will turn the heart of the king for his will to be done. But we have to pray. We have to be, you know, we have to be praying without ceasing. We have to be fervent in our prayer because the Bible tells the Lord says, you know, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. So we have to be fervent in our prayer. So now we come on to God's plan, the end of all flesh. And one thing I realized reading this Torah portion, it was there was a lot of mention about all flesh or flesh. There was a lot of mention about the earth, the land, the earth, flesh, the land, the earth, and the flesh. And it makes me think what is all about this flesh that God and the earth that God is trying to teach us so Genesis 6 verse 11 to 13 the earth was also corrupted before God and the earth was filled with violence see it wasn't just the men it was the earth itself so everything they did caused the earth itself to become corrupt so God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me for the earth is filled with violence through them and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. See, God not only decided to destroy the flesh, the man, but also the earth. And when it's talked about all flesh, it's not just talking about the flesh of humans. It talks, it's the flesh of the animals, the birds, and every living creature. And here again, I show you the how the Strongs translate that word earth. The Eretz is used as land, earth, or country, or ground, world, even way in common field, nations, wilderness, etc. So all when we think about, you know, Noah entering the ark and God decided to destroy all flesh. After God told Noah to build the ark, Noah did what God commanded him to do. God told Noah to go into the ark, but only Noah and his sons and their wives and his wife, only eight people decided to go with Noah in the ark because everyone was comfortable doing their own thing, living their own way and not wanted to surrender to God, not wanted to repent and turn from their evil ways. So God told Noah, chapter seven, verse one to four, the Lord said to Noah, enter the ark, you and all your household for all, for you alone I have been, have seen to be righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven pairs of every clean animal, male and his female, and two of the animals that are not clean, a male and his female. Also of the birds of all the sky, seven pairs made male and female to keep their offspring alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. So here's something I noticed. When God says, only you alone, I have found righteous in this generation or in my sight. See, we have to realize that 
It did not say anything about Noah's wife righteousness. It did not say anything about his son's righteousness. It did not say anything about their wives' righteousness. And this reminds me of the scripture that says, if you believe you and your household shall be saved. So it didn't matter what their his sons did. They came in agreement with Noah and wanted to be in alignment with him and what God told him to do. So they also went into the ark with God. If they did not agree or did not believe what God was saying to Noah that he was going to flood the earth, they could have easily chose to walk away and they wouldn't have been saved. So we have to remember when we are walking in righteousness, when we are continuing to pray for our unsafe family or unsafe loved ones, we have to remember that our righteousness, our walk with the Lord also, when you think protects them even when they don't know it you know there's some times where god will have mercy on our family just because we are honoring the lord so don't think that you know your your prayers and your walk or what you're doing for the lord or your service to the lord or how you have that relationship with the lord goes unnoticed because your your relationship with the lord through yeshua is also like a covering for your family. God, because of your righteousness, God will have mercy on your family, on your family. So be encouraged if you're praying for your family or your family and your friends and they haven't yet come into, come into you know, faith through Yeshua, know that God is still having mercy on them and he will bring them in at the appointed time. God says in 40 days, 40 nights, and I will wipe out from the face of the land every living thing that I have made. So one thing I noticed too is that this Torah portion, it, it is so compact with everything about, you know, Noah and his, his the wickedness of man and Noah's righteousness, you know, the flood happening and Noah building in a heart ark. And after Noah came out of the ark, what happened, you know, how he built the altar and sacri made a sacrifice to the Lord. And then after that, we see again, you know, the, the what happened with the Tower of Babel and how God had to confuse the language. But the central, I, I believe the central message that God was trying to drive home to us in this Torah portion is that all who entered the ark were saved. And it repeatedly in chapter seven, it says this, then Noah and his sons, chapter seven, verse seven, and his wife and his son's wives with him entered the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean animals and animals that are not clean and birds and everything that falls in the ground. They all went into the ark to Noah by twos, male and female, as God commanded Noah. And even in verse 13, it says, on this very same day, Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the sons of Noah, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. Verse 15. So they went into the ark to Noah by twos, talking about the animals of all flesh in which there was the breath of life. Those that entered. Do you guys see how many times they talk about entered the ark, those that entered? And it's repetitive of Noah, his sons and their wives and the animals in all flesh entered. Those that entered, verse 16, male and female of all flesh entered as God had commanded him. And the Lord closed the door behind him. Then the flood came upon the earth for 40 days and the water increased and lifted up the ark. So it rose above the earth. See, also, verse 21, talks, so all creatures that moved on the earth perish birds livestock animals and every swarming thing that swarms upon the earth and all mankind there was nothing spared that was that did not enter the ark verse 22 of all that was on that dry on the dry land in all the nostrils was the breath of life died so it it tells you that they died 
or they and they perished. He repeated the same thing again, just as if just as how he repeated about, you know, they entered the ark. So if they did not enter, they perished. So what is God trying to tell us here? And here again in verse 23, it repeats what was already stated. And it says, and only Noah was left together with those that were in the ark. What is the ark all about? So the ark was a vehicle of protection from destruction. Just as how Yeshua is our protection from destruction. In Yeshua, we are saved and safe. The flood waters that was to destroy all life lifted the ark. The storms of life that come to us in this life is to lift us in lift us higher in our relationship with God when we are in Yeshua. John 15, 4 tells us that if we abide in him and he in us, we will be able to produce fruit. James 1, 12 tells us happy is the one who endures testing because when he has stood the test, he will receive from, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord promised to those who love him. So Yeshua is our ark. He's the one that the Lord sent to restore us back in relationship, to turn us back to the father. So the question we can ask ourselves, what does the life of Noah teach us about Yeshua and the last generation? Since Noah was righteous in his generation, Enoch was righteous in his generation. We even know that it talks about Abraham was righteous in his generation. He walked, Abraham walked with God. And throughout the scripture, we see where it talks about, you know, the prophets, how they walked with God. And this takes us back to this one will comfort us. So let's take a look at what this comfort is all about. Because the declaration that Lamech made about Noah was that Noah was supposed to bring them comfort from the toil of their hands because of the curse of the ground, because of the curse of the Adama, that dust, that the land that was supposed to produce fruit. Since the and so since the flood wiped out all living flesh except for Noah and his family. What happened to the comfort? Did Noah actually fulfill what his father declared? And we can see that in that scripture, we'll see that Lamech prophetically spoke of the one to come, which was Yeshua. And let's take a look at what God did after Noah came out of the ark that tells us how this comfort came about with Yeshua and how it relates to all flesh. So before the flood, man was only given the right to eat vegetation. But after the flood, God did this, God blessed Noah and his sons with the same blessing he blessed Adam. God blessed Noah and his sons and said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon every beast of the earth and upon every fowl of the air upon all that move it upon the earth and upon all the fishes of the sea into your hand they they are delivered every moving thing that live shall be meat for you even as the green herb have i given you all things but the flesh with the life thereof which is in the blood thereof, you shall not eat. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the hand of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of a man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. And you be fruitful and multiply, bring forth abundantly in the earth and multiply therein. So a couple of things I want to bring out. So the word replenish. The other day when I was studying um, bear sheet and I looked at that word replenish. And, you know, this word was also 
part of the command that God gave Abraham, um, excuse me, that God gave Adam, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth. No, the question I ask myself is, if God just created everything, what did Adam need to replenish if everything that he needed was already there? And when I looked at this word, the meaning of this word actually means to produce or to create. And I was like, wow, just as how God said, you know, in the image and likeness, I created, in my image and likeness, I created man. Re the word replenish is basically the emphasis of, you know, that multiplication that man is supposed to be fruitful and multiply because just as how God spoke things into being, God was creative. God gave man the ability to be creative. And also it talks about the fear of you and the dread of you shall be upon the beast of the earth. Why? What is that all about? So you remember in the garden of Eden, it says that the serpent was more subtle than all the beasts of the earth. See, the serpent, or you could say the beast, did not fear man. That's why he, the beast was able to go and speak to the woman. See, now God is letting them know the fear of you will be upon all beasts and every living thing. So it, it won't be that the beast will be able to have conversations with a man anymore, but man will have rule and dominion over the beast. Just as God had given us the spirit to be empower us to rule over our flesh, God is saying, I am giving you the power to rule over the beast. So the comfort of Noah is connected to the meat or flesh that was permitted to eat it is a prophecy of Messiah. And you're probably asking, okay, Natalie, how is this possible? See, God gave man flesh to eat because in the future, all flesh, meaning mankind, would need to eat flesh that brings comfort that was prophesied at the birth of Noah. What flesh am I talking about? See, Yeshua is the word or the bread from heaven that became flesh to save mankind. And when we talk about flesh, let's look at what exactly I'm talking about. So the word in Hebrew for flesh is the Strong's H13-1320, and it's basar, and it's flesh by extension, body of person, also the new new pudena of a man, a body flat, lean flesh or nakedness or self. And it is from the Strong's H1319 and it's baser. See, it's the exact same spelling except for the, the, the vowel markings that differentiates how you spell, how you pronounce the word. So it means it is a primitive root properly to be fresh or to full rosy, figuratively cheerful, to announce, glad news, messenger, preach, publish, shoe forth, bear, or bring, carry, preach good, tell good tidings. Baser is all about preaching the gospel. Baser is the Hebrew word for gospel. And Isaiah 52, 7 tells us, how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings that publish peace that bring good tidings of good that publish it salvation that say unto zion thy god reigneth isaiah 61 we know this very well the spirit of the lord is upon me because the lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings this is the very scripture that yeshua declared before he began his ministry after he was tempted in the wilderness when he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Nahum 1.15, Behold upon the mountains are the feet of him that bring good tidings, that publish it peace. O Judah, keep thy solemn feast, perform thy vows, for the wicked shall no more pass through thee. He is utterly cut off. So let's get into the meat of the flesh, the word. Pun intended, if you get it. John 6.50 1 to 57, Yeshua says, I am the bread of life which came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, 
he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. What did he do? He gave his flesh for the life of the world. Then the Jews began arguing with one another. How can this man give us flesh to eat? So Yeshua said to them, Amen, amen, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Just as the living father sent me and I live because of the father, so the one who eats of me will also live because of me. We know that Yeshua is the word became flesh. And when we eat the word of God, when we eat of the word of God, we have life. When we put our trust in Yeshua, he saves us from death and destruction. Yeshua is the flesh that brings us comfort, is the word of comfort. And also, you remember he said that when I go, the Father will send another comforter, which is the Holy Spirit, and he will comfort us because God never desires to leave us comfortless. So Yeshua, the bread from heaven that became flesh, he was of the spirit to save all flesh of the earth. And we know that in Luke chapter one, talks verse 30, 35, where we see just as how Noah found favor and grace in the eyes of God, Mary found favor in the eyes of God and by the spirit, she conceived Yeshua. First Peter 3, 18 says, For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah. See, Yeshua went to preach the good news to those who did not listen to Noah to give them an opportunity to be comforted. And it says, during the construction of the ark in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water, corresponding to that baptism now saves you not the removal of dirt from the flesh but an appeal to god for a good conscience see the flood could not bring comfort the flood could not save except for those who went in the ark but through yeshua we are saved through yeshua we receive comfort through yeshua we will receive the crown of life if we continue to believe and we continue to walk in righteousness and endure the test of times and we will see the goodness of God at the, in the last days. Verse 22 tells us, Yeshua is at the right hand of God having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Now, our Torah portion ends with the story of Babel, you know, after God delivered Noah and his family out by the ark, Noah actually spent a whole year in the ark before he came out of the ark. And when he came out, the scripture tells us that he planted a vineyard and he planted a vineyard. He drank wine and he became naked when he was drunk and his youngest son ham saw his nakedness and went to tell his two other, older brothers now interestingly what happened in that story is that it says that when noah came to after he came to his realization what and what happened he found out what happened that shem's 
Ham saw his nakedness, but Shem and Japheth walked backwards and covered him. It says that Ham was the father of Canaan, and Noah cursed Canaan. No, Canaan wasn't the one who saw his nakedness. It was Ham. So why would Noah curse his grandson? That's something to ponder. So as so as we look into what happened in the generation to come, because Noah's sons were the one that populated the generation. And it the end of the Torah portion is about the Tower of Babel, where man once again decided to do their own thing, build a tower instead of multiplying and spreading all over the earth. So, and when we think about what happened in that generation, and we think about what's happening in our generation, and even what Yeshua says, you know, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the end. When you think about what's happening in our generation now and what's going on in the world today, you think there is a lot of babble that's going on. And there's a lot of things that people are saying, but some of it don't make any sense. It's like people are trying, just like the the, the men in that generation, they were trying to make a name for themselves. It seems like everyone today is trying to make a name for themselves instead of trying to, you know, bringing glory to God. And I believe that this, you know, is all a part of, you know, the generation of the end. It's all about Babel. It's all about, you know, people trying to make a name for themselves. Genesis 11, 1 to 9, Noah it says, now all the earth used the same language and the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and fire them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for martyr. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach the, into heaven. Let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of all the earth. Now the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which men built. So, question I asked. We see that this is a direct disobedience and rebellion of what God really told man to do. And question I asked myself, if God wiped out all wickedness from the earth with the flood, how can evil still prevail? But it brings me back to the thought that God said when he said that he will no longer destroy the earth with the flood again because of man. Genesis 8.21 says, I will never again curse the ground on account of man for the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. See, it's about the heart. The evil is in the heart. The inclination of man is evil. And David says to this about himself, I was conceived in sin. Does this mean that his parents were sinning while he was conceived? No, this goes back I believe, to what was mentioned of Seth when the Bible talks about Adam when Seth was born. It says in Genesis 5, 3, it says, when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness after his image, and he named him Seth. Now, if we can recall through the genealogies, Noah is a descendant of Seth. And why is this important? Remember, Adam's image before sin in the Garden of Eden was in the image and likeness of God. He was pure, knowing not knowing good and evil. But after sin, he became intimate, knowing good and evil. So the image in which Seth was conceived is the image and likeness of sin, because now sin had entered man. So Noah was descendant of Seth and the flood, an outside solution to evil that was in the heart could not deal with something that was internally. So Noah's descendant populated earth after the flood. And that is why we need Yeshua, the one that 
is to comfort us from the toil of our hands because of the curse that the Lord put on the ground. So what does this mean for us? As Yeshua says, in the last days, it will be like the days of Noah, Matthew 24, 23. And we are to be ready at all times. First Timothy 4, verse 1 and 2 tells us, Now the rock clearly states that in latter times, some will fall away from the faith, following deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the hypocrisy of false speakers who own conscience has been seared. See, God always prepares his people and gives warning before he brings destruction. So even with Yeshua telling us, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the end, that's a warning and preparation for us to know when we see these things are happening. Even Yeshua, in, if you read the whole chapter 24 and 25, he talks about all the things that supposed to happen. He says, when you see these things, it's not yet the end, but it is the beginning of the end. So our responsibility in our generation is to be blameless before God. How do we walk out being blameless? We cling to the word of God. We walk according to his Torah. We walk according to his commands. And as I mentioned before, pray for those in authority. Pray for the peace of the city that you live in so that you will also live in peace. Number four, let it be said of you, you are righteous in your generation. We are to follow the example that is set before us. See, we might not have someone in our family that we can look back and say, you know what, my grandmother was a believer, or my grandfather, or, you know, I have go back two, three generations and I have those examples. But the Bible tells us in Hebrews that we have a cloud of witness to follow. And even Paul speaks to Timothy about, you know, that generational faith in righteousness that he saw in him. It says first, second Timothy one, five to six, say, I call the genuine faithfulness within you, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I'm sure it is within you as well. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands keeping the standard of sound words you have heard from me in the faithfulness and love that are in Messiah Yeshua, guard the good that has been entrusted to you through the Ruach HaKadosh who dwells in us. See, we might not have physical examples in our lives or in our, in our, in our family to say, you know, I could, this is one person that I know that was righteous in their generation, but as we come into faith, we have countless number of people in the scripture that we could follow, that we that we can model their example through the word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can be righteous in our generation so that we can bring glory to God and draw people to him. Number five, we must be ready. Why? For no one knows the hour or the day the Son of Man, Yeshua, will return. And this is what he says. Be sure of this, that I that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would not have been allowed, not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. We have to be like the five wise virgin who trimmed their their lamps with oil. Let us be ready at all times. Number six, live to make Adonai's name great. It's all of our relationship is all about making his name great, doing his will, doing what he desires to accomplish on the earth. Remember Yeshua when he taught the disciples to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Colossians 3.17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Yeshua, giving thanks to God the Father through him. 
1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. Our work, our deeds should all be about God. And just like Abraham, may God's name great. And because Abraham made God's name great, God made Abraham's name great. He is the father of the faith and let us follow his motto to live to make God's name great. And number seven, the final thing for the night, make disciples. This is the great commission that Yeshua gave us. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to all nations. We are to make disciples. It is not a us for no more shut the door kind of salvation. It is a let's make disciples because the Lord called us to be fishers of men. And I pray this word bless you tonight. And that's all I have for you guys.